Chapter 2 My Father the Falcon I always knew my father had trouble with words. Sometimes they would get stuck and he would repeat the same syllable over and over like a record caught in a groove as we all waited for the next syllable to suddenly pop out. He said it felt like a wall came down in his throat. M's, P's and K's were all enemies lying in wait. I teased him that one of the reasons he called me Johnny was because he found it easier to say than Malala. A stutter was a terrible thing for a man who so loved words and poetry. On each side of the family he had an uncle with the same affliction. But it was almost certainly made worse by his father, whose own voice was a soaring instrument that could make words thunder and dance. Spit it out, son. He'd roar whenever my father got stuck in the middle of a sentence. My grandfather's name was Roll Amin, which means honest spirit and is the holy name of the angel Gabriel. He was so proud of the name that he would introduce himself to people with a famous verse in which his name appears. He was an impatient man at the best of times and would fly into a rage over the smallest thing, like a hen going astray or a cup getting broken. His face would redden and he would throw kettles and pots around. I never knew my grandmother, but my father says she used to joke with my grandfather, by God, just as you greet us only with a frown, when I die may God give you a wife who never smiles. My grandmother was so worried about my father's stutter that when he was still a young boy she took him to see a holy man. It was a long journey by bus, then an hour's walk up the hill to where he lived. Her nephew Fazli Hakim had to carry my father on his shoulders. The holy man was called Luano Pur, Saint of the Mad, because he was said to be able to calm lunatics. When they were taken in to see the Pur, he instructed my father to open his mouth and then spat into it. Then he took some gore, dark molasses made from sugar cane, and rolled it around his mouth to moisten it with spit. He then took out the lump and presented it to my grandmother to give to my father, a little each day. The treatment did not cure the stutter. Actually some people thought it got worse. So when my father was 13 and told my grandfather he was entering a public speaking competition he was stunned. How can you? Roll Amin asked, laughing. You take one or two minutes to utter just one sentence. Don't worry, replied my father. You write the speech and I will learn it. My grandfather was famous for his speeches. He taught theology in the government high school in the village of Shapur. He was also an imam at the local mosque. He was a mesmerizing speaker. His sermons at Friday prayers were so popular that people would come down from the mountains by donkey or on foot to hear him. My father comes from a large family. He had one much older brother, Saeed Ramzan who I call Uncle Khan Dada, and five sisters. Their village of Barkana was very primitive and they lived crammed together in a one-story ramshackle house with a mud roof which leaked whenever it rained or snowed. As in most families, the girls stayed at home while the boys went to school. They were just waiting to be married, says my father. School wasn't the only thing my aunts missed out on. In the morning when my father was given cream or milk, his sisters were given tea with no milk. If there were eggs, they would only be for the boys. When a chicken was slaughtered for dinner, the girls would get the wings and the neck while the luscious breast meat was enjoyed by my father, his brother and my grandfather. From early on I could feel I was different from my sisters, my father says. There was little to do in my father's village. It was too narrow even for a cricket pitch and only one family had a television. On Fridays the brothers would creep into the mosque and watch in wonder as my grandfather stood in the pulpit and preached to the congregation for an hour or so, waiting for the moment when his voice would rise and practically shake the rafters. My grandfather had studied in India, where he had seen great speakers and leaders including Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, Jawaharlal Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi, and Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, our great Pashtun leader who campaigned for independence. Baba, as I called him, had even witnessed the moment of freedom from the British colonialists at midnight on August 14, 1947. He had an old radio set my uncle still has, on which he loved to listen to the news. His sermons were often illustrated by world events or historical happenings as well as stories from the Quran and the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet. He also liked to talk about politics. Swat became part of Pakistan in 1969, 
the year my father was born. Many Swadis were unhappy about this, complaining about the Pakistani justice system, which they said was much slower and less effective than their old tribal ways. My grandfather would rail against the class system, the continuing power of the cons and the gap between the haves and have-nots. My country may not be very old but unfortunately it already has a history of military coups, and when my father was eight a general called Zia ul Haq seized power. There are still many pictures of him around. He was a scary man with dark panda shadows around his eyes, large teeth that seemed to stand to attention and hair pomaded flat on his head. He arrested our elected Prime Minister, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and had him tried for treason then hanged from a scaffold in Rawalpindi jail. Even today people talk of Mr. Bhutto as a man of great charisma. They say he was the first Pakistani leader to stand up for the common people, though he himself was a feudal lord with vast estates of mango fields. His execution shocked everybody and made Pakistan look bad all around the world. The Americans cut off aid. To try to get people at home to support him, General Zia launched a campaign of Islamization to make us a proper Muslim country with the army as the defenders of our country's ideological as well as geographical frontiers. He told our people it was their duty to obey his government because it was pursuing Islamic principles. Zia even wanted to dictate how we should pray, and set up salat or prayer committees in every district, even in our remote village, and appointed 100,000 prayer inspectors. Before then mullahs had almost been figures of fun, my father said at wedding parties they would just hang around in a corner and leave early, but under Zia they became influential and were called to Islamabad for guidance on sermons. Even my grandfather went. Under Zia's regime life for women in Pakistan became much more restricted. Jinnah said, no struggle can ever succeed without women participating side by side with men. There are two powers in the world, one is the sword and the other is the pen. There is a third power stronger than both, that of women. But General Zia brought in Islamic laws which reduced a woman's evidence in court to count for only half that of a man's. Soon our prisons were full of cases like that of a 13-year-old girl who was raped and become pregnant and was then sent to prison for adultery because she couldn't produce four male witnesses to prove it was a crime. A woman couldn't even open a bank account without a man's permission. As a nation we have always been good at hockey, but Zia made our female hockey players wear baggy trousers instead of shorts, and stopped women playing some sports altogether. Many of our madrasas or religious schools were opened at that time, and in all schools religious studies, what we call diniyat, was replaced by Islamiyat, or Islamic studies, which children in Pakistan still have to do today. Our history textbooks were rewritten to describe Pakistan as a fortress of Islam, which made it seem as if we had existed far longer than since 1947, and denounced Hindus and Jews. Anyone reading them might think we won the three wars we have fought and lost against our great enemy India. Everything changed when my father was 10. Just after Christmas 1979 the Russians invaded our neighbor Afghanistan. Millions of Afghans fled across the border and General Zia gave them refuge. Vast camps of white tents sprang up mostly around Peshawar, some of which are still there today. Our biggest intelligence service belongs to the military and is called the IC. It started a massive program to train Afghan refugees recruited from the camps as resistance fighters or Mujahideen. Though Afghans are renowned fighters, Colonel Imam, the officer heading the program, complained that trying to organize them was like weighing frogs. The Russian invasion transformed Zia from an international pariah to the great defender of freedom in the Cold War. The Americans became friends with us once again, as in those days Russia was their main enemy. Next door to us the Shah of Iran had been overthrown in a revolution a few months earlier so the CIA had lost their main base in the region. Pakistan took its place. Billions of dollars flowed into our exchequer from the United States and other Western countries, as well as weapons to help the IC train the Afghans to fight the Communist Red Army. General Zia was invited to meet President Ronald Reagan at the White House and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher at 10 Downing Street. They lavished praise on him. Prime Minister Zulfikar Bhutto had appointed Zia as his army chief because he thought he was not very intelligent and would not be a threat. He called him his monkey. But Zia turned out to be a very wily man. 
he made Afghanistan a rallying point not only for the West, which wanted to stop the spread of communism from the Soviet Union, but also for Muslims from Sudan to Tajikistan, who saw it as a fellow Islamic country under attack from infidels. Money poured in from all over the Arab world, particularly Saudi Arabia, which matched whatever the U.S. sent, and volunteer fighters too, including a Saudi millionaire called Osama bin Laden. We Pashtuns are split between Pakistan and Afghanistan and don't really recognize the border that the British drew more than 100 years ago. So our blood boiled over the Soviet invasion for both religious and nationalist reasons. The clerics of the mosque would often talk about the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in their sermons, condemning the Russians as infidels and urging people to join the jihad, saying it was their duty as good Muslims. It was as if under Zia Jihad had become the sixth pillar of our religion on top of the five we grow up to learn, the belief in one God, namaz or prayers five times a day, giving zakat or alms, rosa, fasting from dawn till sunset during the month of Ramadan, and hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, which every able-bodied Muslim should do once in their lifetime. My father says that in our part of the world this idea of jihad was very much encouraged by the CIA. Children in the refugee camps were even given school textbooks produced by an American university which taught basic arithmetic through fighting. They had examples like, if out of ten Russian infidels, five are killed by one Muslim, five would be left or fifteen bullets, ten bullets equals five bullets, some boys from my father's district went off to fight in Afghanistan. My father remembers that one day a Maulana called Sufi Muhammad came to the village and asked young men to join him to fight the Russians in the name of Islam. Many did, and they set off, armed with old rifles or just axes and bazookas. Little did we know that years later the same Maulana's organization would become the SWAT Taliban. At that time my father was only 12 years old and too young to fight. But the Russians ended up stuck in Afghanistan for 10 years through most of the 1980s, and when he became a teenager my father decided he too wanted to be a jihadi. Though later he became less regular in his prayers, in those days he used to leave home at dawn every morning to walk to a mosque in another village, where he studied the Quran with a senior Talib. At that time Talib simply meant religious student. Together they studied all the 30 chapters of the Quran, not just recitation but also interpretation, something few boys do. The Talib talked of jihad in such glorious terms that my father was captivated. He would endlessly point out to my father that life on earth was short and that there were few opportunities for young men in the village. Our family owned little land, and my father did not want to end up going south to work in the coal mines like many of his classmates. That was tough and dangerous work, and the coffins of those killed in accidents would come back several times a year. The best that most village boys could hope for was to go to Saudi Arabia or Dubai and work in construction. So heaven with its 72 virgins sounded attractive. Every night my father would pray to God, O oh Allah, please make war between Muslims and infidels so I can die in your service and be a martyr. For a while his Muslim identity seemed more important than anything else in his life. He began to sign himself Ziaud and Panchbiri, the Panchbiri are a religious sect, and sprouted the first signs of a beard. It was, he says, a kind of brainwashing. He believes he might even have thought of becoming a suicide bomber had there been such a thing in those days. But from an early age he had been a questioning kind of boy who rarely took anything at face value, even though our education at government schools meant learning by rote and pupils were not supposed to question teachers. It was around the time he was praying to go to heaven as a martyr that he met my mother's brother, Faiz Muhammad, and started mixing with her family and going to her father's hujra. They were very involved in local politics, belonged to secular nationalist parties and were against involvement in the war. A famous poem was written at that time by Ramit Shah Sayal, the same Peshawar poet who wrote the poem about my namesake. He described what was happening in Afghanistan as a war between two elephants dash the US and the Soviet Union, not our war and said that we Pashtuns were like the grass crushed by the hooves of two fierce beasts. My father often used to recite the poem to me when I was a child but I didn't know then what it meant. My father was very impressed by Faiz Muhammad and thought he talked a lot of sense, particularly about wanting to end the feudal and capitalist systems in our country, where the same big families had controlled things for years while the poor got poorer. 
he found himself torn between the two extremes, secularism and socialism on one side and militant Islam on the other. I guess he ended up somewhere in the middle. My father was in awe of my grandfather and told me wonderful stories about him, but he also told me that he was a man who could not meet the high standards he set for others. Baba was such a popular and passionate speaker that he could have been a great leader if he had been more diplomatic and less consumed by rivalries with cousins and others who were better off. In Pashtun society it is very hard to stomach a cousin being more popular, wealthier or more influential than you are. My grandfather had a cousin who also joined his school as a teacher. When he got the job he gave his age as much younger than my grandfather. Our people don't know their exact dates of birth, my mother, for example, does not know when she was born. We tend to remember years by events, like an earthquake. But my grandfather knew that his cousin was actually much older than him. He was so angry that he made the day-long bus journey to Mingora to see the SWAT Minister of Education. Sahib, he told him, I have a cousin who is 10 years older than me and you have certified him 10 years younger. So the minister said, Okay, Maulana, what shall I write down for you? Would you like to have been born in the year of the earthquake of Kuwata? My grandfather agreed, so his new date of birth became 1935, making him much younger than his cousin. This family rivalry meant that my father was bullied a lot by his cousins. They knew he was insecure about his looks because at school the teachers always favored the handsome boys for their fair skin. His cousins would stop my father on his way home from school and tease him about being short and dark-skinned. In our society you have to take revenge for such slights, but my father was much smaller than his cousins. He also felt he could never do enough to please my grandfather. Baba had beautiful handwriting and my father would spend hours painstakingly drawing letters but Baba never once praised him. My grandmother kept his spirits up, he was her favorite and she believed great things lay in store for him, she loved him so much that she would slip him extra meat and the cream off the milk while she went without. But it wasn't easy to study as there was no electricity in the village in those days. He used to read by the light of the oil lamp in the hudra and one evening he went to sleep and the oil lamp fell over. Fortunately my grandmother found him before a fire started. It was my grandmother's faith in my father that gave him the courage to find his own proud path he could travel along. This is the path that he would later show me. Yet she too got angry with him once. Holy men from a spiritual place called Darai Sadon used to travel the villages in those days begging for flour. One day while his parents were out some of them came to the house. My father broke the seal on the wooden storage box of maize and filled their bowls. When my grandparents came home they were furious and beat him. Pashtuns are famously frugal, though generous with guests, and Baba was particularly careful with money. If any of his children accidentally spilt their food he would fly into a rage. He was an extremely disciplined man and could not understand why they were not the same. As a teacher he was eligible for a discount on his son's school fees for sports and joining the Boy Scouts. It was such a small discount that most teachers did not bother, but he forced my father to apply for the rebate. Of course my father detested doing this. As he waited outside the headmaster's office, he broke out into a sweat, and once inside his stutter was worse than ever. It felt as if my honor was at stake for five rupees, he told me. My grandfather never bought him new books. Instead he would tell his best students to keep their old books for my father at the end of the year and then he would be sent to their homes to get them. He felt ashamed but had no choice if he didn't want to end up illiterate. All his books were inscribed with other boys' names, never his own. It's not that passing books on is a bad practice, he says. It's just I so wanted a new book, unmarked by another student and bought with my father's money. My father's dislike of Baba's frugality has made him a very generous man both materially and in spirit. He became determined to end the traditional rivalry between him and his cousins. When his headmaster's wife fell ill, my father donated blood to help save her. The man was astonished and apologized for having tormented him. When my father tells me stories of his childhood, he always says that though Baba was a difficult man he gave him the most important gift, the gift of education. 
he sent my father to the government high school to learn English and receive a modern education rather than to a madrasa, even though as an imam people criticized him for this. Baba also gave him a deep love of learning and knowledge as well as a keen awareness of people's rights, which my father has passed on to me. In my grandfather's Friday addresses he would talk about the poor and the landowners and how true Islam is against feudalism. He also spoke Persian and Arabic and cared deeply for words. He read the great poems of Saadi, Alama Iqbal and Rumi to my father with such passion and fire it was as if he was teaching the whole mosque. My father longed to be eloquent with a voice that boomed out with no stammer, and he knew my grandfather desperately wanted him to be a doctor, but though he was a very bright student and a gifted poet, he was poor at maths and science and felt he was a disappointment. That's why he decided he would make his father proud by entering the district's annual public speaking competition. Everyone thought he was mad. His teachers and friends tried to dissuade him and his father was reluctant to write the speech for him. But eventually Baba gave him a fine speech, which my father practiced and practiced. He committed every word to memory while walking in the hills, reciting it to the skies and birds as there was no privacy in their home. There was not much to do in the area where they lived so when the day arrived there was a huge gathering. Other boys, some known as good speakers, gave their speeches. Finally my father was called forward. I stood at the lectern, he told me, hands shaking and knees knocking, so short I could barely see over the top and so terrified the faces were a blur. My palms were sweating and my mouth was as dry as paper. He tried desperately not to think about the treacherous consonants lying ahead of him, just waiting to trip him up and stick in his throat, but when he spoke, the words came out fluently like beautiful butterflies taking flight. His voice did not boom like his father's, but his passion shone through and as he went on he gained confidence. At the end of the speech there were cheers and applause. Best of all, as he went up to collect the cup for first prize, he saw his father clapping and enjoying being patted on the back by those standing around him. It was, he says, the first thing I'd done that made him smile. After that my father entered every competition in the district. My grandfather wrote his speeches and he almost always came first, gaining a reputation locally as an impressive speaker. My father had turned his weakness into strength. For the first time Baba started praising him in front of others. He'd boast, Ziaudin is a Shaheen dash a falcon, because this is a creature that flies high above other birds. Write your name as Ziaudin Shaheen, he told him. For a while my father did this but stopped when he realized that although a falcon flies high it is a cruel bird. Instead he just called himself Ziaudin Yusafzai, our clan.